Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. I'm here with my good old Georgia Southern friend, Angie Tillman. All of her links will be down in the description box below. And we are we have a very special Monday mystery for you guys because we are going to revisit a story that I covered. It was one of the first stories I covered on my channel back when I started my channel. And I've been prompted to recover it because I think my opinion has drastically changed since the first time I covered this story. And um, I, I, I haven't even rewatched my video yet. I just read the research all from scratch um, to talk about this legend, this folklore here in Georgia. And this is the Georgia werewolf. Now, Angie, you had not heard of this, right? When I first brought this up to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't. I, I think I did see parts of your old video like a long time, whenever you posted it in the beginning and I just, you know, cooking supper and had it play in and I wasn't really honestly paying that much attention. I was just like, huh, whatever. Not didn't really pay that close attention. But um, yeah, and back then I probably wouldn't have even believed it. And now I question everything. Everything. <laughs> and I'll tell you guys, like, because obviously the concept of a werewolf is shape-shifting. And we know that this is a big, um, a big awakening. Part of the awakening is understanding that there are humans that have this ability to shape shift. And I've talked to a lot of people who don't have YouTube channels who work hot in high spiritual places that talk a lot about this ability that humans have to shape shift. And apparently a lot of people actually do have this encoded in their DNA. They might not know it though. And I was thinking about it too. I was thinking, okay, well, what's the logical thing about shape shifting? Well, if you think about it from just a very basic human perspective, the time a baby is born, we are constantly changing our shape anyway. We're growing and changing. And when we work out, our muscles change. Um, I know when people start a yoga practice, they typically grow a couple of inches because they're releasing those knots. And so what's to say that we can't actually change the physical makeup of our body, especially if the body is the Shakti is the expression of the soul. Now, from what I understand, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, it depends on what bloodline you're born into as to what you can change, what you can shape yourself into. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Like reptilians, werewolves. Yeah. Um, now, from what I understand too, and I, I actually do believe this, if someone is a shapeshifter, if they know how to change their shape, even for werewolves, and we're going to talk about this with this case, not all werewolves are bad. Somebody said to me, you know, there are people that are shapeshifters that you know in the world today that are werewolf shapeshifters, and they're here to protect. And so they go into protection mode when they change into this wild animal of a werewolf, which I thought was very, very interesting that there is that perspective that yeah. some of these people, I mean, we look at angels, angels, uh, we both Angie and I grew up in a Christian faith. I'm sure a lot of people watching grew up in a Christian faith. There was a lot of debate over what an angel is. Is an angel an off-worlder? Are they celestial beings? We don't really know. Big question mark there. But we know that they have the ability to shapeshift. We know that an angel can come into a human form in order to help or to do what needs to be done. We know they have that ability. Um, we, you show uh, touched by an angel and then what? Highway to Heaven. Or both of those shows about like an angel in human form they come into human form. And there's so many stories. There was this book I read a long time ago called angels watching over us. And it was all these stories of people who had had experiences with angels. And some of them actually saw the bright light, but some of them saw them in a human form um, and knew that they had come, they put themselves into human form in order to not scare someone or to do what needs to be done. And so this idea of, of a soul. So regardless of whether a human being or an animal or a celestial being, we all have this, this soul and that soul is really who we are, but the outer shell of the soul, which for us would be our body is an expression of that soul. So what's to say we can't learn how to change that from time to time. And I know my friend Jesse Zaboder has said that kids in the, in the dark arts that have this ability or of this bloodline typically learn how to do this at very young ages when their brain is it completely soul. Like for us, Angie, it'd probably be hard for us if someone tried to teach us because we're so stuck in our ways, right? We're so stuck in our bodies. But for a child, they learn how to do that, how to weave in and out of that when they are children. And again, and I'm, I'm going to say this again, it's not all for people who do know how to shape shift. They're not all bad. If you, if you guys remember from the Sophia code, Mary Magdalene's story, she was a shapeshifter. She talked about changing into a lion to hunt demons. 
we see with that with the Lyran soul celestial soul system a lot of people are Lyran their, their soul comes from Lyra that is the Christ consciousness that's why um, the Christ is often displayed as a lion and so where do these ideas come from they obviously come from something and I, as I said I'm, I'm gonna tag my video my original video in the description box below I have not rewatched it though I made the decision not to rewatch it because I wanted to see if I could look at things from a different perspective now that this is a couple of years later and my thoughts around this have changed a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll put that in the description box below. They did think the family did think this girl suffered from a um, issue called like, like Lycanthi like can't I was saying that right, which is basically a mental disorder where people think they're werewolves. However, I think that's just an excuse and we'll get into the story. Um, now I am going to say this guys, th these are real people. Even though this happened in the 1800s here in Georgia, these are legitimate people. This is not made up, uh, made up people. I, I actually was telling Angie before we hit record that I actually spent all day yesterday going through um, court documents, marriage licenses, uh, graves. I actually traced down the multiple generations. There are descendants of this family still in that area of georgia to this day and so i'm going to ask i know our audience is very respectful but i'm going to ask our audience if you do live in georgia and you are near this place please have respect for the family we don't know the full story and so we always want to remember to stay within those lines of consent and um and the the werewolf of georgia herself did not have any children so this would be her great 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 nieces and nephews or whatever but just remember that um we are going to talk about the family graveyard which is very common here in the south to have family graveyards which is the owens family graveyard um, from what i understand it's blocked off now because so many people have tried to break into this graveyard and we'll explain why that they have actually um roped it off the family has roped it off and if you do break into the graveyard just be aware they will call the police uh, because this this legend has been around for a very long time and people are trying to get into and see where this woman um was buried and so let's kind of get into it i'm going to start by sharing the screen here and what i am going to show i'm not going to show all the records of um the descendants because they, they need their own privacy. I did that for my own research just so I kind of knew what boundaries I had in, in presenting this story. So we're talking about this woman named Emily Isabella Burt. Now here they say she goes by Emmy. Some records you're going to say that she, they're going to say that she went by the name Isabella. Uh, we're going to call her Emmy just for lack of a, a better name to call her. So you will, but you will see both Emmy and Isabella when and, and speaking about her. She was born on the 29th of July. 1841 she died on the 18th of june 1911 she is buried at the family cemetery the o owen cemetery which is in woodland talbot county georgia which is very rural georgia this mm -hmm. area of georgia only has like a thousand residents to this day um very rural it's about uh an hour and a half ish from where angie grew up in albany and albany is a bigger town so i'm just going to read you what it says about her just in this grave marker. Emily Isabella Burt grew up in an area known as Pleasant Hill near Talbotton, Georgia. Although her name is mentioned in several books as being known as the Georgia War Werewolf, it is important to note that those stories are pure fiction. But are they? Emily Isabella Burt was not mentally ill. She did not suffer from the mental disease known as lycanth lycanthropy, um, which... The stories back to differ when it comes to that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. She lived and learned from her mother, who was a great and kind person, an extraordinary businesswoman. Isn't that so Southern to say about someone? Her mother was a great and kind person. That's so, that's so Southern. At the time of her death, Emily Isabella Burt owned about 300 acre estate in Talbot County, partial ownership of a warehouse in Talbot County, a house in, in a land in Bullockville, um, and a house in Columbus, Georgia. I don't know where Bullockville is, but Columbus, Georgia is literally, so Talbot County is literally 30 miles northeast of Columbus. And Columbus is a pretty decent sized town here in, in Georgia. It's right on the border of Alabama. So she, that would have probably been the big city for them to go to and get what they needed. It's only 30 miles outside of Talbot County. Um, her obituary reads, um, Miss Emily Burt of Midland, Georgia, died at the home of Miss Benson in Marietta, Georgia. Now, Marietta, Georgia, for those who are not from the state of Georgia, Marietta is right outside of Atlanta. That's where my sister actually lives. And so it's quite a bit of ways from um, Talbot County. So, and Miss Benson was her niece. 
Okay, so she had moved in later in life with her niece. Um, Sunday, January 18th, 1911, her remains were brought to, to Woodland for the burial Tuesday, June 20th, 1911, and more extended notice of her death will appear in these columns next week. Uh, death of Miss Emmy Burt. Miss Emmy Burt was born and reared in this county midway between Bellevue and Pleasant Hill at the Burt Homestead. We're going to talk about this, the, what this means, the Burt Homestead. For more than half a century, this dear old home was a heat of, the seat of hospitality and neighborly cheer. That's very oh, southern. <laughs> very hospitality, neighborly cheer. A few years ago, she made her home with her widowed sister, Mrs. Mildred Butts. About a year ago, the two sisters moved to Marietta, Georgia, to live with Mrs. Mrs. Butts' daughter, Mrs. Luther Benson, where Mrs. Butts died on June 18th after several years of failing health. Everything that devoted love and care suggests or best man of medical skill could accomplish was done to prolong the life of this dear one, but all in vain. How Southern is this? Yes. Death, death, though, uh, inevitably is always sad. But when it takes us from one who has grown dear with such a passing year of a lifetime is undoubtedly doubt distressing. The death of Miss Emmy Burt sorrows to many of the hearts here in Talbot County, where she lived for so many years and where her name is a synonym of Christian greatness and great. Her ministering hands have brought comfort and cheer to many sick beds and her unfailing sympathy, uh, hope to the sorrowing and afflicted. Wherever she went, her noble, unselfish nature was a proverb among her friends. God bless her precious memory and consecrate it to the eternal good, to those who love her and bring peace to the stricken hearts of her only sister and other near and dear ones who consider her loss irreparable. She was buried by the side of her father and mother in the family cemetery near Woodland. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Um, that is very Southern, the way that it was written. So Emily, Emmy, was one of four children. And it's interesting they, they talked about her one and only sister. Yes, she did have one and only sister. Let me see if I can go back because I actually first started looking through the graves because I was looking for her mother and father's story because that's that's yeah. really where, um, hold on a second, that is really where we see the beginnings of this. So let me find, um, okay, so here are her siblings. Um, Alpheus Joel Burt, Sarah Burt Goodman, and Mildred Owens Burt Butt, which is the sister she ended up living with. So she had three other siblings. So her mother was a woman named Mildred Ann Owen Burt. Now, the Owens Family Cemetery is where she is buried. Okay. Her husband was a man named Joel Hurt Burt. So Joel Hurt Burt himself, what a name, Hurt Burt, um, <laughs> was very, very wealthy. And if we know anything about the way family cemeteries are run in the South, it's safe to say that Mildred and Owen Burt also came from a very, very wealthy family. Wouldn't you say so, Angie, if they have their own family cemetery? Yes, if they had their own family cemetery. Um, yeah. Like, it, it would be notable. Like, you know, notable, like. Notable, yes. Uh-huh. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. And my, my mom's family, the Bryce's have a family cemetery in South Carolina. And so we, we would talk about that a lot growing up as kids, how you would have these family cemeteries on these homesteads. Uh -huh. So, and Angie and I've spoken about this before that the, the South, there's a lot of freaking money down here in the South. Yeah. There is a lot of money down here. And so at the time, if we're looking at the timeline of when this took place, this was right before the civil war. Now it's interesting. I don't really know what the civil war was was anymore now that we're talking about Tartaria. But what they did say in a lot of the research when I looked into Talbot County was that the Talbot County used to be a pretty well populated um, county when there were slaves. Once the, the, uh, the, uh, the Civil War was over, that's when the population decreased. So if I had to guess from the mainstream narrative, both the Owens family and the Burt family probably got wealthy off of agriculture from their plantations. Now, with that being said, now that we know about Tartaria, I'm not so sure anymore. And that's one of the questions we, I want to do a follow-up with Stephanie. I don't know how we're going to ask this because we want to be very careful about privacy is who exactly were these families? Maybe she yeah. was an evil werewolf, not a good one. Maybe and she, I don't know. Well, that's the thing is that, so we're going to talk about her dad too, because this is where it really gets interesting because Joel Hurtbert, who's also buried in the Owens family cemetery. Now, 
This man was born on the 7th of January, 1807, and he died at only 40 years old at 1847. So he died young. Even in this time period, he was considered to be a young death. And you can see his brain was kind of cracked here, which is very concerning if this is where the line of um, werewolves comes from. And the reason why I say that this is where the line of werewolves come from is because it said that Emmy unlike her other sister and siblings looked just like her father. So Emmy um, apparently had very hairy, bushy eyebrows, which now bushy eyebrows are in vogue. Brooke Shields. <laughs> I don't have bushy eyebrows. I'm too blonde for that shit, but, um, but they're very in vogue now. Um, and she was, she was very shy. She was not social. And something that was interesting is that she was said to have very sharp white teeth that made her smile very uh, scary for a lot of people like fangs. And there was even a story in my research that Mildred, the mother, Mildred, tried the best she could to get her daughter's teeth fixed by whatever dentistry was available at that time to no, um, to no success. And so now a lot of the pictures in the 1800s, people don't smile anyway. They're very statuesque and solemn in their pictures, but that was, so I don't know if that's just added, uh, exaggeration to the folklore if that really is is the case but i thought it was interesting that she looked just like her dad and her dad died so young so there's a possibility i'm just in speculation because we know these are bloodlines that if she were a werewolf she inherited it from the burt family because her three siblings there's no stories about her three siblings displaying um these behavior traits and what beh behavior traits are these well okay Sorry, guys. I was telling Angie, our pollen is so bad here. My nose is running like crazy. So excuse me. I'm going to have to blow my nose from time to time. <laughs> All right. So. Okay. So when Joel passed away at 40 years old, his wife, I'm assuming, was already probably um, independently wealthy, but then she also inherited all of his wealth as well. And that was the Burt birth Homestead. They had a huge property. They were very prominent. And Mildred herself was only 37 years old when her husband died. Now, at that point, I'm assuming 37 was not as young. It was still young, but not as young as it is today. That's younger than me and Angie. So here she was, this woman very prominent, had all this money. And so she sent her four children. Well, some reports say all four. Some reports say just the daughters. She sent them off to school in Europe. Okay? So she packed them up, sent them to school in Europe. Now, that's Just not to be able to do that, you I mean, you have to be very wealthy. <laughs> yes. And that's not... I mean, we have... Like, I went to a very prominent private school. We have private schools all around the nation. That's not really common for white rich people in the south to send their kids to school in europe yeah. i don't see that happening that much so there in my opinion if she what most women would have done in that time period would probably if it was just her girl she sent away she probably would have sent them to like a um what, what were they called um schools for girls where they learned how to be social there was a name for them I forgot what they were called. They were like, a, you know, you know, the girls would go away to these schools where they would learn how to like be the, the house, yeah. like hostess, you know? Um, and there were, those schools were in Atlanta and up in the Northeast. And that would probably be where a, a refinery school where these girls were sent in most cases. So the fact that either all four or two of the girls were sent to Europe is very interesting to me. Very interesting. Now it is also said that Emmy was an avid reader as was her father. So part of the inheritance was a collection of all these books. Now that might sound crazy today, but back then this was a status thing. And so Emmy would stay and read. And apparently she loved supernatural books as did her father, which kind of gives a lot of um, intrigue into this uh -huh. mystery. So after they, the kids first were sent off to Europe and then they came back home, which think about that, that would have been getting on boats and traveling back across, you know, on a boat. Um, she started to show signs of a sickness. And so the sickness caused Emmy to suffer from insomnia where she could not sleep at night. Now here's the kicker. They could get her to sleep sometimes if they gave her an elixir made of opium. Listen, <laughs> 
they gave me opium when I had my appendix taken out at 12 years old. That is the best I've ever felt my whole entire life. I remember it like it was yesterday. If you, I mean, if, if the, it, it, it would only work sometimes. So if the opium is not working all the time, then this is something very serious. Now, what was crazy is when she would have these bouts of insomnia, according to what I found, she would um, not remember. Like she would come home and she'd been out in the pastures all night and she wouldn't remember. It was like she was in a trance. She wouldn't remember being out, out in the pastures all night. <laughs> <laughs> like she wouldn't remember this. I mean, you guys like, okay, let's talk about being in the pastures at night in the middle of nowhere, rural Georgia. <laughs> that is not comfortable. Is it <laughs> probably full moon? <laughs> yeah, well, we're going to talk about that too. But yeah, like we were talking in this thing and they had those long, heavy dresses on. We're talking y'all like in the South when it's 90 degrees in the daytime, it's also 90 degrees at night too. Like there's, it, it's not that big of a difference. And it, there's mosquitoes, there's gnats, there's cow patties everywhere. Snakes, very poisonous snakes everywhere. As a kid, we had to learn rhymes about snakes when we were playing outside. So we knew how to spot them. So the fact that she's not remembering roaming around the pastures in the middle of the night when it would have been super uncomfortable and hot anyway. It's wild. And so her mother, according to some of the rest, the, the research, her mother started to suspect something, which tells me what did her mother know about maybe there is there a family secret here that she knew about her father. Her mother started to suspect that something was going on. Now, around this time, a man named William Gorman. Now, I'm going to go back to the grave here. Because William Gorman is a legit person again. So Sarah Burt Gorman, this was her husband. Okay. So William Gorman, around this time, he started courting Sarah, her sister. And Sarah, her sister, they were the only two girls, Emmy and Sarah, was, um, she was a few years older than Emmy. She was born in 1836, where Emmy was born in 1841. Now, that's what I found interesting is all these stories, these people are legit people. You can look through the records. They legitimately existed. We have it right here. So William Gorman was like 11 years older than Sarah. So at this point, and we know in the South at this time with the white people of the South, your kids are only going to court kids within their same social background. It's not like Sarah is going to go off and, and marry the, the farmer's kid down the street that didn't have two pennies to rub together. No. no, that's just not how it was done. So obviously this Gorman fella was probably came from another prominent family. He was 11 years older than Sarah, which is fine. A lot of men I date are a lot older than me too. So I, I get you, girl. I get you. So um, um, he already had established his own homestead where he had uh, livestock, sheep, cows, and something was going on in the town. So all of a sudden the townsfolk, their livestock was getting mutilated at night and nobody knew what was going on. Now, William Gorman went over to the Burt's homestead because he was courting Sarah and he was concerned about Mildred, the widowed mother, because she doesn't have a husband. There's something happening to livestock. This is obviously the bed of, uh, bread and butter for most of the town uh, in rural Georgia. And so he's coming over and explaining to Mildred, Mildred, that, there, that, Mildred that there's um, a wild animal that's killing the livestock. And he is going to arrange for a posse of men to go hunt this beast. Well, they try setting up all these traps. They can't catch the beast. And so as good stories go in the town was also this very weird Eastern European man. And this Eastern European man started saying, you're not going to catch this beast because this is a werewolf. And from what I understand, werewolves come from Eastern European Europe. So that's where they originally like it's the song werewolves of London or <laughs> where was it Georgia now? <laughs> uh, they yeah. did go to school in Europe. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> my thing. That's um, we're going to get back to that. So this Eastern European like town weirdo, as they called him, was um, saying, oh, this is this is a werewolf. This is not just some beast. And so after this posse of men could not catch this this wild animal, they took this weirdo from Eastern Europe a little bit more seriously. And we're like, how do we catch this werewolf? And so they had they said it had to be on the night of a full moon. Um, you had to melt down silver, put it in the bullets to, to shoot. And so as William Gorman is trying to keep Mildred, his future mother, mother in law, abreast of what is happening, Mildred is is understanding that this is her daughter doing this. And so Mildred decides that she's going to go out with the men 
to hunt this werewolf. Okay. So she loads up her, which I'm telling you guys, like this is the 1800s in Georgia. That would have been a sight to behold. <laughs> See a, a wealthy white woman in her puffy skirt, his, her scarlet O'Hara skirt with a bunch <laughs> of men and a rifle, but it shows you what a mother will do for her child. And so she's trying to protect Emmy. Well, somebody shoots the gun and hits the beast in the left hand and the beast, scurry, beast scurries and runs off. Well, that next morning when Emmy woke up, apparently she had a wound in her left hand. And so what Mildred did next was Mildred packed up Emmy and sent her to Paris for a couple of years to work with the doctor in Paris who worked with people who suffered from light, like like lycanthria or however you say it, the, the disease where they think that they think they're a werewolf. That's the story. And then when Emmy came back, it all kind of died down. Now, of course, as we saw from her obituary, she did. Um, she became a very successful woman in Talbot County uh, in her own right. She never married, never had children, but she was a landowner, which again was huge back in those days. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I will say in the South, it does seem like, in that way, I think the South was a little bit more progressive than the rest of the world because women were given um, yeah. inheritance. Right. They, they were not, you know, in some in some uh, areas culturally at that time, you know, your husband would inherit your wealth as a woman. It would just pass through to your husband. But in the South, we did actually see that where women were wealthy within their own right. And so in that way, the South was pretty progressive. And then, of course, she moved up to Marietta with her with her sister and her niece when she got older and probably needed more help. And then she passed away and she's buried again in Talbot County at the Owens family cemetery. Now here's where it gets interesting too. So people in Talbot County still say that on a full moon, Emmy's werewolf roams around the town as a ghost. And I've been, I was watching some YouTubes of people and I'll, I'll place these in the description box below people from the area. And one woman said, I'm not a believer. I'm a knower. I know this is happening. I know it. Now, another interesting right. thing is that on um, her on her tombstone, it talks about now that she's dead, she can keep to her own form. That is on her tombstone. And so, you guys, that on the tombstone, on the tombstone, it says now she can keep to her own form. So my opinion now is that she was a werewolf. She was a shapeshifter. I don't know if the, her father's family was corrupt or evil, but I don't think Emmy was. I think maybe something triggered in her DNA and she started, started shapeshifting or maybe something happened to her when she went to Europe and something got activated and she didn't have anybody to teach her. And then when she went back to Europe, she was trained in how to control it. Right. And because all of a sudden the livestock started vanishing. And those teeth. Those teeth. I mean, <laughs> I mean she doesn't look like that. I mean, they, they talked about her being like a very unfortunate looking woman. But I am not. Um, I don't think she looked that unfortunate, to be honest with you guys. I thought she, she looks like a fairly attractive. Let's see here. A fairly attractive woman from the 1800s. Yeah. I don't see an ugly woman here. Now, of course, we can't see the details of her face and her body, but that was spoken about in a lot of different, uh, here's the full uh, tomb here. Now, notice it is in the shape of an obelisk. Now, we know obelisks aren't always bad. Obelisks do harness energy. Um, so what are your thoughts, Angie? <laughs> well, I kind of believe it. I never believed in these things before, you know, I just thought it was all just made up stuff. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard stories of not necessarily the, a werewolf, but I have heard stories of other things, um, furry things that people see. And I don't, I don't think it's false. I mean, like the Bigfoot thing, I, I think yeah. so much is possible now. Everything. Exactly. Exactly. And so, and that's why I want to be really careful with the, the, the descendants, because if this is a lineage, then it could be their descendants are also shapeshifters. And I don't want to, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You know, um, from what I, from my friends who specialize in this, they say most of us are, and we just don't know it. 
we don't wow. know that we can change into something else. Um, and, and I, you know, looking at her picture and what they say, like, no, she was a very kind Christian woman. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that tells me that she probably did have a good heart. And I'm thinking like when she was younger, again, she didn't know what she was doing. All she was changing. She was hunting. She didn't know she was hunting, but when she was taught how to control it, then she could control it. But it's interesting to me that this happened in the mid 1800s and it's still an active legend in 2022 in that area of Georgia to this day, it is still an active legend. And so that, that to me where there's smoke, there's fire. Yes. Yes. So uh, I didn't want to go, but like you said, we can't go see the the graves or anything. I was looking at t- kind of the homesteads and things, trying to find that kind of thing too. I didn't really find anything much. Did you? Yeah. And a lot of the, for, I, I followed. So I, I really went through all the records and I followed to see like how many people, I mean, there were four, again, there were four children. Emmy didn't have children, but the other three did have multiple children. So you're talking like multiple people that are descendants of this family. Some are still in the area in like the Columbus area, but some have moved to Florida. So, um, and obviously I don't think they're going to, I mean, how would you, I mean, I don't know how I'd react if my ancestor was the famous werewolf of Georgia. Like, would I ignore it or would I laugh about it? Like, what would I do, you know, in that situation? And so, and of course she lived yeah. with her sister up here in Marietta, which Marietta again is right outside of Atlanta. It's a suburb of Atlanta. It was its own town at one point before it became a suburb, very old town. Mm-hmm. But I don't know of any claims of Marietta of there being sightings of a werewolf, you know, but then Marietta is a lot bigger than um, Talbot but County. That would have been when she, later in life after she had learned to suppress it. <laughs> yes. Control it. Yes. Control it. So, and so I definitely, I don't think, and it makes me wonder more about, um, uh, this disorder like lycanthropy, because what is lycanthropy? According to science, it's a mental disorder where you think you're a werewolf. But if you're showing the signs why, of being hairy, why would there be so many people that they even have a name for that? Like, exactly. Like, is there no, I mean, there are one person out there in the whole world that thought they were a freaking werewolf and they weren't. I could understand. But if there's a whole group of people in this world that suffer from this, <laughs> Is there something more to this story? Well, and now you've got like in our high school here, you've got the furries. Oh, yeah. Like dressing up as animals and things. I mean, um, there was even one getting on the school bus in my neighborhood a couple of years ago. Like, I just saw it. I'm like, okay. Um, I mean. So my question, (laughs) what do you think? And I'd love to hear what the audience has to say about this too. Like, so moving forward and we start to understand more about shapeshifters and that shape. I mean, Stephanie and I just looked into the Jersey devil. Apparently the Jersey devil is a freaking shapeshifter too. Like if we, if we can do this, our, our, I mean, listen, if I could shapeshift, I just want to shapeshift my stomach into a permanent six pack. (laughs) That would be, or make my legs a little longer. Like that would be my desire. I would, I don't want to change species. I just want to like, fix what I got, you know, make my boobs a little perkier without having to go under, <laughs> <laughs> under surgery. But, um, but how, if, if this is something that human beings, and if we think about that, so if we think about the fact that us on earth, earthlings, as we're called, um, what makes us so powerful is that genetically we're a hodgepodge of all these different galactic groups, the Lyrans, the Palladians, you know, the avians, the C- Syrian, like, and these are all have different looks about them, right? They're all humanoid. But if we carry all those genetic dispositions, can we then tap into a genetic disposition and change into the shape of that? Does that make sense? It does to me. It used to wouldn't. <laughs> I know. I know. Listen, I've, I've always, you know, I kept, when I was researching this again, Angie, I kept thinking about the show True Blood. Did you ever watch the show True Blood? Mm-mm. No, it's a vampire show, but they talk about shape shifting, werewolves, all sorts of stuff. And of course, it takes place in Louisiana. All this stuff takes place in the South. Well, there's also an interesting thing, too, I wanted to bring up as well. So if we're and when I first covered the where covered the werewolf of Georgia, I did not know about Tartaria. So I was very much sold on the history that we had been taught in school. Now I question everything. And if we're looking at the. Um. Tartarian history in Rome, Georgia, where I grew up, right outside of Atlanta. Um, there is, let me see if I can pull it down here. 
we have a Romulus and Remus statue <laughs> right in front of the city hall. Now we're told that Rome, Italy gifted Rome, Georgia, a copy of this statue because we're a sister city. But now I question everything. Is Rome, Georgia, the real Rome, Italy? And why, what's the story of Romulus and Rebus that fed off of a wolf? And does this connect to the werewolf of Georgia with Emmy Burt? I've never thought about that. I've seen this. I've only been to Rome maybe twice. And I remember seeing this and thinking, it's just so weird. It's so weird. It's so weird. And it's right outside of the city hall, which is also the yeah. city auditorium. So it's like where all the kids go. And Rome, Georgia is like population 25,000. It's not a big town. So it's, you know, you got the kids going there to have like their dance recitals, their piano recitals. And there's this freaking Romulus and Remus of these naked baby boys <laughs> bursting from the animal, which again is a famous story from the Roman pantheon. I get that. Um, and it's how, you know, I've been to Rome, Italy. I love Rome, Italy. And it's a big part of their heritage as to how, how the, the city of Rome was established. But you just start to, to rethink everything. Like it, to me, when I see these kind of things now, like used to, because I never really knew that story, I would think that is so gross. And then, but now I'm going, <laughs> it's probably really true. <laughs> right? Like, and that's what we were going to do in part two with Stephanie um, to have her pull the cards on some of this stuff. And I don't, uh, you know, with Stephanie, we, uh, she doesn't want to hear the story because she wants to be completely free uh, yeah. her mentally to channel. Uh, we will be talking about this again on Aquarius Rising Africa too, but as you know, and Rome, Rome, Georgia is also Woodrow Wilson. Uh, his wife was from Rome, Georgia. And what, well, here's a statue of her right here. Um, and Woodrow Wilson was the uh, president that signed the Federal Reserve Act. Mm. So mm. super interesting. Like it's, it's, it's all, I'm just like, there has to be more to the story. So we have, the famous Romulus and Remus statue, copy of it, copy of it, in Rome, Georgia, where Barry College is, where we know we've done a deep dive into Barry College and the Barry family. And then we have this Georgia werewolf down in Talbot County. These are two, Rome, Georgia is also a very wealthy city. And in 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 there's, there's a lot of money in this state, guys. There's a lot of old, old family money. I mean, Angie, yeah, it I makes me think of weird that, you know, I, I'm always like putting these all connect connections together, but like the movie, remember the old book song of the South yeah, like band and all that. But I remember like that there's an uncle Remus <laughs> library in, um, um, I think it's Eatonton, Georgia, the uncle Remus library. And then there's a whole like little, there's a little museum, the uncle Remus, um, museum down there. Um, gosh, I went when I was really young, so I don't really remember it too much. But um, it's a bitty do da. Did you ever see the movie? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Did they ban that movie for like racism at some point? I think so. I think I've got the book. Somewhere. I mean, I I we sing that. My mom would sing that with us as kids. Yeah, it's shit's not adding up. Basically, like yeah. shit's not adding up with these stories. I mean, it, it is kind of adding up, but not in the way that we were taught. And but in um, that movie, from what I remember, they had like the man, you know, Uncle Remus, but then there were these animals. So you, and they talked that wasn't there a wolf and then a, a rabbit. And then I can't totally, it's been so long since I've seen it, but it was like half cartoon half. Yeah. I mean, that means almost like, okay, since we're, since we're questioning the whole civil war thing and uncle Remus is this black man, right? If, if, yeah. I, if I'm remembering right. Um, and so, but he was not a cartoon, but he was real but then all the animals that could talk and everything, they were fake. They were cartoon. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to get a hold of this book or this movie and watch it again. And I'm thinking, well, you know, because that, that's not the real song of the South. That's not the real story of the South. Or, uh, maybe it's just not what we were told. No, it's not what we were told at all. And there is, I mean, I've said this before, Angie, you've said this, one of my good friends who is um, not originally from the South, but lives here now, and she's very shamanistic, will tell you out of all the places in the world, she's been everywhere. The South is the most magical. Mm -hmm. There's something about this, the Southeast. There's something about it. There is something, the South is alive. 
I say that a lot when I go to Charleston, South Carolina, where my, my mother's family is originally from. You walk down the streets of Charleston and it, the city breathes. Yeah. Like the city's alive. And um, I find that a lot down here in the South. There is a, a there is the South is not dead. It's like that William Faulkner book, The Unvanquished. And um, we, you know, Stephanie and I talked a lot about Egypt and the, uh, you know, for, I'm studying Thoth now for the Emerald Tablets. And if this area is Egypt, you know, and if, if the Egyptians were the leftovers from Atlantis, you know, we know the Noah's Ark story that was supposed to be about the flooding of Atlantis, which was the apocalypse. We, we've already been through the apocalypse, guys good news we've already been through the, we're in gog and magog now which means we're going to ascend but when that flooding of atlantis came through um a lot of people went to high ground so it wasn't just Noah and his family that survived there were a bunch of, of humans of all different races races which we now know to be galactic origins mm -hmm. uh, angie and i are not white because our ancestors are from north europe did i tell you that i googled my you ever just google yourself and just see what google comes up with you know, every year, like, oh, it's always different. So it wasn't too long ago, I Googled my name and it said that I was um, Middle Eastern and a Jew. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. yeah. That's I'm, what, well, my, you know, it's so funny. I did 23 in me before I knew it was bad. Yeah. I, so, see, I didn't want to do that. That's why I just Googled myself. I was like, what do they think I am? I mean, I'm not sending in my blood, but, or my slava, but I know. had a ton of Egyptian, Coptic Egyptian pop up in my reading. Um, you know, and, but the thing is, is like, we've been sold this story of evolution that we all originated in Africa and then we migrated elsewhere. And that's why Angie and I are white blonde haired people is because our ancestors went to Northern Europe and over time they changed the climate and the blah, 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 blah. Well, that's not true. That's just not true. And I, even before I woke up when I believed evolution, I, I've been to South Africa a few times. And I was always very curious at the Afrikaans people. I've also been lived in Europe for a while. Dutch people are pretty petite, like you and me. Mm -hmm. Afrikaans people who are descendants are brutes. And I know that they're, they're bigger people because of their land, their, their water, their air. But their skin hasn't gotten darker. Their hair's actually gotten blonder. So it's like the sun hits them differently. Like when I, when I'm in the, in the sun, I get dark and my hair gets get even dark. blonder. Yeah. Yeah. My hair gets even blonder. It doesn't change. It gets blonder. It doesn't get darker. And so that always was weird to me. Like, well, then how would hair change? Like, how does this work? And so then when I started to wake up and I started to study uh, the galactic, I was like, oh, because we come from different galactic constellations huh? and some of us like a lot of my friends who are technically black have a lot of white in them as well my friend um she has an irish grandmother so her hair's got a bit of a red in it and so we are caring when we look at that we are a melting pot of all these different galactic nations yes. and so with e egypt the egypt that we think of which was the remains of the fall of atlantis we're talking there were white people black people all, there, as I was saying with Stephanie, there were blue people. Like no one talks about the blue people, but in these pictures, there are freaking blue people. Where are the blue people? You know, um, but they all lived harmoniously together. But people will see that in paintings and things and don't even question it. They're just, you know, I'm like, there's blue people. Like, <laughs> it's an expression. No, even at, at, at Abe Lincoln, let me see if I can pull that up. So the Lincoln Memorial in um, DC, Lincoln Memorial. That was my uh, favorite monument, I think, that I went to for some reason. Well, it's the one I could kind of feel something there. Uh, um, Stephanie and I both got like chill bumps there. It's an yeah, ISIS temple. I it's not, too. it's an ISIS temple. And you even say in the back, it says in this temple. I'm seeing, so in the Lincoln Memorial, up, up, so like right here, you kind of see in the background, there's like a little, there's paintings here. They're old Egyptian paintings and they're blue people in those paintings. <laughs> Like how many thousands of people walk through this memorial every single freaking week and nobody's been like, why the hell are there blue people? They just walk like zombies. But I mean, whenever I'm there, I'm like, I didn't want to leave it. I wanted to keep like, because I could just feel something, you know? And this was back, it was like 22 years ago when I was there. And I still remember the feeling. Like, yeah. Just, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not, okay. You kind of see it up here too. Like it's for the paintings right there. They're on either side. 
and it's it's like okay so the original atlanteans must have known that our skin color and our hair color were just significant of where our lineage came from in the galactics right equal to each other they all work together but then with the controllers they obviously like to divide conquest and divide and divide us and control us that they obviously created these you can see it better here there's a painting here um that they wanted to create this idea of like a, a race issues when it's literally no we're not not none of us are really from this earth we're all a collection of, of all these different which is the original 12 tribes of israel we're not coming from jacob they were the 12 galactic tribes that make up the population of this earth so you know if we're looking at the south all the way up to dc as being part of egypt and we're looking at the back to the romulus and remus statue back to her as a shapeshifter yeah is there a connection i kind of feel like there is how do you do <laughs> and um if her if, if i want to know if anybody watching this from talbot county and you've had an experience with the ghost of the werewolf please send me an email i would love no, to i was trying to figure out if i knew anybody from talbot county and i did not ask my facebook friends yet but i should do that because i've got people i don't really know personally but on my facebook that are from all over georgia and there's got to be somebody somebody it's got to be i mean i know it's like less than a thousand residents today but it's, <laughs> even if you're from columbus because columbus georgia is yeah. literally like 30 miles north of columbus so if you're from columbus and you know of this um let us know because i I'm, I'm thinking there my opinion has completely changed i don't think this is folklore i don't think it was just a girl who had social issues i think this was a family bloodline of werewolves and i think it has something to do with tartaria and i think it has something to do with the romulus and remus copy of a statue that mm -hmm. Rome, georgia has because i'm doubting everything now that the controllers have told us um and so i want to know too from anybody else if, if is there werewolves in your neck of the woods do you have legends mm -hmm. of not just a general werewolf but is there a story of a person just like we have here in georgia of an actual living person actually lived that's carrying this tradition of being the werewolf um let me know because and i want to know is this strictly so if we talk about shape-shifting coming from particular bloodlines our particular galactic bloodlines if this comes from eastern europe are werewolves then let's say just a white people thing and are there other species people can um shapeshift in if they're asian or if they're black let me know because this is wild to me and we're all trying to relearn this together because they they don't teach you this in school. I think school would have been way more fun if they taught you about this kind of stuff. It really would. It really would be. They don't teach. Mm, I just can't even go, go there right now. <laughs> no. no. So bad. They say that the controllers, that they have their own history books and their own school books, and we have ours. So I'm sure that the kids that grew up in these families learned about this stuff, obviously, because they learned how to do it. I want to get a hand on their books. Yeah. Like when we know the Bible, there are stories of shape shifting in the Bible. Um, King ne Nebuchadnezzar shape shifted into a wolf. So or a cow or some some animal. I can't remember. I need to look that up because that's you know, that'll help me explain this to my friends that are like, what are you doing on there with Bryce? It's the Bible. <laughs> it's in the Bible, guys. Like this is what's wild. So please let us know, guys. I'm so happy, Angie, you got to revisit the story with me. I've been really, I've been really feeling like been pushed to revisit the story and i think this story is going to open up maybe pandora's box in a good way to to having us collectively start to understand that this is a possibility and again i'm just going to reiterate guys there are still people in this family around just please be respectful mm -hmm. um you know we don't know the full story and people are um they 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 need their privacy so um when we when we meet with stephanie stephanie has a good way of figuring out how to divinate because we're not going to channel anybody alive we're not going to do that or any or emmy herself we're not going to like invade that privacy um because i can imagine that this could have been a very traumatic thing for someone to go through especially for a girl because especially at that time in the south you know I, I imagine it's pretty lonely to not to be a woman and not be married um in the south what that stephanie could come up with answers to you know why it was hidden or why you know why we don't why we were told that these people are just thinking that they're were werewolves instead of you know why is all that hidden when well, it, yeah you know why are they labeled as crazy is that fake news yeah when they're not 
there's something wrong. You know, most of the time when you think something's wrong, something's wrong, you know, and are people having these, these activations like, oh my God, I'm not fully human. And they're not, and it, and by ignoring it, is that creating the, the, the furry sensation because they don't have the proper way to channel their own. Oh, this makes me think a little different about the furries. Yeah. Is it not just some weird yeah. fantasy or fetish, but is it because they've been so neglected into like their own abilities that they've now channeled it into like more of a negative fetish type of thing? Uh-huh. That makes sense. It so does. because we know that the darkness can't create anything it can only steal from the light and invert it. And so is that part of inverting it is making people who perhaps would be good werewolves and would be able to protect instead of allowing them to understand what they are, they've created into like a fetish that is not healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I never thought I would be when I started. <laughs> out, I I would be. And I'm like werewolves lives matter too. Werewolves lives matter. <laughs> We need to make that a t-shirt, Werewolves Lives Matter. So, yeah. So, you guys, let me know um, if you have any stories. Thank you so much, Angie, for joining me for this Mystery okay. Monday. And we'll do a part two with Stephanie and see if we can get some answers from the cards. Um, again, always hit the cards with a grain of salt. But it's, the, it's literally one of the only tools we have since we don't have all of the resources um, academically yet. I think we will have it soon. But yes so all right guys i hope you're having a wonderful monday and wonderful start of your week buckle up mercury retrograde's been a bitch this time around but we're almost through it we're almost at the end so anyway again please go check out angie's channel especially if you love southern women because she's got one of the best channels it's so entertaining and i, I love southern women so much because they're the funniest strongest most savage women on the earth are southern women and so Go check her out. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys.